on the spread of the virus and the effects of the measures we have already taken. At Stop going. Infections is now on the verge of what? U.S. dry cough and or a fever. U.S. dry cough and or a fever. Frontline and the battle against coronavirus. A big increase in the number. Accelerating a dramatic surge. The government reporting. In the last hour, we've had. I open now and go straight to New South Wales. To the nurses and doctors. Okay, so if you could give like this documentary a name, what would you call it? Sorry for the inconvenience. <laughs> COVID-19 is a contagious disease. The first case was identified in Wuhan, China in December 2019. Since then, it has started to spread worldwide, leading to an ongoing pandemic. The virus has taken lives of many, and governments have put in preventative measures such as social distancing, lockdown, quarantine, track and trace, and many others. It has really tested the human race. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. So this is when lockdown started in the UK. Panic buying and just panic in general I mean, it was almost like a movie. So it's quite ironic. This is where my project really started. So like a couple of weeks ago, like when it first started, I looked at online shops. I couldn't get an online shop anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I managed to get one on Tesco for this Monday coming. So that was like two weeks ago, I got this one. Um, but at the moment, I'm in the queue for Ocado. And I was in it like since this morning and like an hour ago, I finally got to the front of it, but you have to click a button and you have to click it within 10 minutes of it popping up. Oh and I just missed it. And then I went back to the start of the queue and I'm like 150,000th in the queue again. Oh my God. I went to Asda's not that long ago. Had to queue up to get in. Yeah. Unlike these queues, the rest of the world looked abandoned and people across the country have been affected in their own way. So at first, it was really peaceful and quiet, and now we're on the third lockdown, you start to realise the things you miss. You miss your friends, you miss going out. It's just crazy to think that the whole world is going through the same thing. Yep, so which lockdown affected you the most? The first, the second or the third? I'd probably say socially the second one. The first one was more of a it's a new thing kind of thing, so you just got to get used to it. But then the second one, remember what was like in the first one, you kind of thought, realise how crap it is. And then this third one is just, well, you just want it over with, don't you? You know, the pub's been shut as well, and no social life, and it's just a nightmare. It's yeah, quite strange having to like distance yourself from people. I found it quite hard, because um, I quite like yeah. cuddling people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I found it quite weird when mum and Charlotte and dad came. And when they came to the door, I was so used to not hugging people. Mum came in for a hug and I was uh, like, took a step back and I was like, whoa, are we hugging? Um, um, yeah, it is strange. So you're still going to work at the moment? Yes. You are. So how's it affected like your work? Um, well, we can't have any relatives in at the moment. Yeah. So obviously there's an emotional side to it because family are worried to and the, the relic and the old people do notice that they're not seeing their loved ones yeah. you know what I mean so there is a there is a worry and a and a sense of change in there but we're yeah. just trying to deal with it and and make them um things as normal as possible for them because like they've got dementia so they don't really need to know that there's a killer virus out there because that would just they wouldn't take that in and that would worry me then they wouldn't understand it so we're just trying to make things as normal as possible for the ones as many as we can do you know what i mean yeah so yeah. it is it is very worrying we've got to obviously be very careful we've got to wash our hands after every resident we've got to wear gloves got to wear aprons some people are wearing masks personally i don't like them if the patient hasn't got it they yeah. I think it's quite intrusive to the old people and I can't breathe under <laughs> it personally. But that's just my, you know, but some people 
but yeah. I, I, I'm not. Um, <laughs> I had a bit of an emotional. Um, I think I was whole, I think I was being strong and thinking, oh, this is all going to be all right. You know, mm. awful that people are dying. It's not going to touch me. It's not going to touch my family. Yeah. And then I think when that lockdown went down the other night, yeah. um, Same. I sort of sort of made everything come into reality a little bit and I sort of had a bit of a meltdown and sobbed for about two hours. Yeah. But then I felt better after that. Yeah. I think... I think you have to let your emotions out and admit that you're worried, admit that you're scared. I conducted this interview at the beginning of lockdown and everything has changed really dramatically since then. So I thought it'd be quite interesting to get an update and show you exactly how things have changed in just months. I must admit, I do feel happy to be. Even though you're scared, I do get a lot from going into work because we're their family yeah yeah mm. and there's no one else to do it for them bless them yeah and even though it's a bit scary our work are giving us masks it's long two hours that we've now got face guards oh my god oh my god i bet they're hot aren't they got the guard <laughs> when you've got right so the thing is now we have to constantly wear just the little mask yeah, yeah. Mm. All, all shift. Have you got them? The Have you got plenty? Just the, just the... Yeah. Good. So we've just got to wear that all shift, no matter what we're doing, even if we're just sat. Yeah. Um, and then when we do personal care, we have to put the guards over the mask. Oh, blimey. The, because, because then you can't breathe. You can't breathe. No. You, you mm. can't. Yeah. And then you start heavy breathing and your mask is up. <laughs> but I see yeah. I see this morning you said that is it four people have been diagnosed with it, like tested or something? What in my what in, in my work? Yeah. Right well, sadly we lost five residents. Oh. Quite close to one another. Mostly men or we mostly men. Uh uh Yeah. Because they say it affects men, men more. Two, two men, two, three men, two women. Yeah, yeah. Due to the, due to the person. <laughs> so we have got it in one of our units. Yeah. But realistically, I think it's in other units. Yeah. In fact, they're the only two that were tested. Yeah. But if you'd have tested the people in other houses, can you'd find that... It is how it is. In care homes, the virus spreads like wildfire. There was a study into the mortality rate in care homes for the first wave, and the figure stood at 10,000 people, which is a lot, but it's also said to be hugely underestimated on further study. So when COVID testing became available around the UK, you can imagine how much it helped decrease the spread. The test involves taking a swab of both your nose and throat, and some people reported it to be painful and some people didn't. How many times have you had the test? Uh, I've had the test over 20 times from work. Um, when we work for different productions, we have to have more tests. So if I work for two or three productions a week, I have two or three tests a week. It's just a cotton bud that goes in your throat and up your nose, and that's it. Where do you go to get the test? Um, they normally have centres for having it done where I am. Yeah, it's all very efficient. There's a nurse there who uh, does the test for you. Uh, oh, you get the results within two days, but I have had one test where I got the result within five minutes. Uh, that was just a test where they swab your nose and then they put it, put it in a solution and they give you the results straight back straight away. I had a message from um, Track and Trace on the 2nd of December saying I had to go into isolation for about, uh, well, 14 days at that time. I isolated for about a week before getting a test done. Um, the test, myself, I wasn't very scared for the test. I knew it went um, to the back of your throat and up your nose, which uh, it didn't really bother me. I think everyone has a certain, a different effect to it. So me and my uh, dad got it done at the same time. He had a really 
a uh, not great reaction to it. He like gagged a lot. Um, I didn't find myself struggling with that. The one thing I didn't like is the after you swabbed in your mouth, you have to go up your nose and you have to go quite far up your nose. And I have very small nasal passages, so it did actually quite hurt. Um, and it caused my nose to bleed a bit. So, but the whole system was pretty good. You dropped it into a box. There was no contact or anything. I then found out my results two days later, maybe even less than that. After the test, it's like a really bad game of Russian roulette, waiting for a response that could alter your life forever. I'm going to take you back to the interview I had with Alicia, as she really did have quite an experience with COVID-19. And it came back that I was positive with COVID. Um, I had quite a lot of the uh, rarer symptoms of COVID. So like I had a cough for a day and then it went. Uh, the ones that I felt the most was a headache, uh, pain, especially in my eyes, fatigue uh, for the first few days. And then I had insomnia, which was horrible. But my first day, which I was like, I'm not well, is um, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, I'm going to be sick because uh, I felt very nausea. My headache was pounding. I had to wake my uh, dad up. And then I went back to bed, woke up in the morning and that day I remember I slept for 18 hours because I was just so exhausted and so much pain I couldn't do anything. And then every day the symptoms developed so the next day I couldn't stand up for more than two minutes without passing out. But as soon as I slept for 18 hours that's when the insomnia hit so the further week I had it for I just couldn't sleep. I had maybe two hours sleep a night and it was not very nice. Again, the, the, the worst one was the pain. I didn't have, I have underlying breathing conditions as well. So I was very, very nervous when I found out I had COVID because I was just like, this could, this could kill me because I don't know. I've had two years of testing done on my nose, on my lungs everything because I have breathing problems and I'm just like if this gets to my lungs I could die and knowing that it is terrifying. How would I describe my experience? It was probably, I can see both positives and negative sides of it as well as the negative sides of obviously the physical aspects. Mentally it hit me so much. I wasn't allowed in college, I couldn't see my friend, I missed my friend's 18th birthday and it just crushed me because I could see them having such a good time and I was stuck at home and I didn't, I tried like every day, it's sort of like you had to try and get up, get dressed, some days you didn't feel well enough to get up and get dressed and those days were the hardest because I looked at myself and I was just like, what are you doing? Like. You just watch films all the time. One of the things that they don't really talk about with COVID is the fact when you get out of isolation, everyone treats you like you're a monster. And it is everyone. You may have the occasional person or two, like you're close with, and go like, oh, we're so happy you're out again, you can come see us. But the majority of people, if they know you have had COVID, they will treat you like you are utter dirt on their shoe. I got told by people not to come near them. I got told to, I got insults and everything because I had COVID and I was over it. And I had tests that said I was now negative, but to them I was still a monster, um, which that hits you. But yeah, that's one thing people don't talk about is the effect after you've had a COVID to other people. But uh, I think my entire family have had COVID. Um, my mum's had it twice. And just to know that like, so many people have passed away from it, I feel incredibly grateful that we're all still alive. To know that people all around the world are going through similar experiences to this is almost unthinkable. So being almost a year since the virus has emerged, Pfizer, Moderna and Oxford have developed vaccines that took a new approach that were incredibly quick to design. They inject a tiny fragment of the virus's genetic code into the body, which produces a part of the coronavirus and pushes the body to a defence. All three vaccines require two doses. In the UK, it's currently being rolled out in steps, 
giving to the most vulnerable people first, and I personally think it's a major breakthrough and will hopefully stop this deadly disease. I've talked to multiple people, and here is a few who I think have an interesting take on the vaccine. So, have you had the vaccine yet? Yes, I had it um, December. I was so lucky. I was called into Wexham Park. Yeah. Somebody rang me and said, would I like to go that afternoon? Yeah. And I said, oh, I don't know. I haven't even thought about it yet, or I don't know much about it. <laughs> so she said, have you got any questions then? And I said, yeah, well, I heard different things that it can do to you. It may put a chip in you or, you know. Put a chip in you? What else is there that um, you heard? That it makes um, some gentlemen sterile and stuff like that. Yeah. And that can a bad reaction. Oh, Hendrix. And uh, she explained everything to me. No, no, no and explained it all, it's all right, it's safe, and um, would you like to come along? There's a 20 yeah. past three appointment. And I said, oh, okay, I'll go for it. And I was so glad. I waited about an hour. I had the appointment, but I did wait about an hour. But there wasn't many people there. Yeah. And I had it done, I didn't feel it, and I was so glad. And they said, you come back in three weeks and have the second one. So on oh, okay. January the 2nd, not having any car at that present time, the neighbour took me and waited outside. And I said, no, don't wait, I'll get a taxi. No, I'll wait. And I was lucky enough to get in and out quickly. And they told me, you'll probably be the last one now, the last lot of people come here and have the second one because they're going to yeah. get down to one and so that everybody gets a chance to have one. I think what has been stated in this video is very important, specifically surrounding the vaccine rumours. Organisations such as the World Health Organisation and the Independent have completed surveys showing these conspiracy theories and their link to the lowered rates of vaccinations. This suggests that there is a lot of people who believe in these theories. I was talking to one lady who strongly believed in these, and she also showed me her views on COVID-19 as a whole. Here you are. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, some of the stuff that you need to know is it's particularly targeting black people, uh, very old people, and people with pre-existing uh, conditions. It's mm. very, very serious uh, in the way that actually euthanizing people. I could not believe so it. The right. social distancing is, is just with people that you don't need to social distance if you haven't got anything wrong with you, let's put it that okay, way. Okay, right. But if you have bronchitis or a cold, then it's a good idea, particularly elderly people. If, but the reason people are dying is very sinister when they go into hospitals. So it's very, very sinister. And I was like, I, I know, I know, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. but I know, I know, I yeah. know there's something terrible. But it's all coming up. Yeah. And there's going to be a mass awakening. And people, I can see that you're wide awake, you're red pill. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. But those people that can't wake up, I mean, they're going to be throwing themselves off buildings. So we yeah. try. I don't know how to to hold them. I don't. You know, we've got. We're doing the Zoom thing because we are the people that have to hold these people. When it comes on to mainstream media, the real truth. Yeah. About five hundred and children being trafficked every year in the States and all this Satanistic stuff that is not, it is real and is being hidden. And that's what this virus is, to hide all of this stuff. The thing is to keep us strong and to also say, what the hell are we going to do when people are waking up? How are we going to hold them? How are we going to give them that love? Because they won't listen. I go outside on the street and they tell me I'm insane. Oh, here she comes. This mad woman talking about Bill Gates and the fact that, you know, vaccinations. And they laugh at you and they, they won't talk to you. They come out every week, Thursday, 
well done NHS and then they go back into their houses it's like the step of white <laughs> Yep, okay, so what do you think about the people who fear vaccines? Fear vaccines? I think they're just um, influenced by the wrong people, really. People that are just taking what they've seen on Facebook or you know, rumours they've heard about it and not actually you know, finding out for themselves the truth about vaccines. And I'm sure probably most of them have had vaccines as children and haven't, have, you know, they haven't suffered any bad effects from that. So I really don't know what they are too worried about. If they actually did a little bit of research, listen to the actual scientists and not, you know, rumours, then, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a big problem. A lot of scaremongering that's unnecessary, really. Yep. Do you know anyone who believes in these theories? <laughs> Funnily enough, yes. Um, the man I got my puppy from, he was he was a full believer in all of the conspiracy theories, from you know the vaccine containing a microchip that's going to track you, to <laughs> you know this being like a a. <laughs> a a government scam to get us all under control. It was just the most uncomfortable situation I've ever been in to sit with someone that fully believed all that. When to me, it's just it's just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Okay. So, do you know of any conspiracy theories surrounding the virus? So many. I'm yeah. sure you your guess will be as good as mine. So many, yeah. Um, any particular ones you're interested in, or? So many. So, I, I mean, it's got to come up and then I could answer whatever I, I could do. But yeah. so many come up. Do you believe in any of them? Not really. Why? I, I'm actually, my, my decision is based on the scientific evidence. Yeah. So I look at the science. And as much as I do empathize with what people say, I always go by the science. Yeah. What would you say to the people who think that they don't need it? do need it because you're protected more than people that haven't had it. What's the point in saying, no, I don't want it, like somebody I know that should have it, my sister-in-law, and she's not going to have it. She said, you don't know that it's going to protect you and all rubbish like that. It's like some people like just go to church and stuff like that to be protected anyway in case there is a god, which is stupid. Personally, I have found it quite astonishing, the sheer amount of people who are saying that they don't want the vaccine. I was just looking on Facebook and someone posted the question, and people who I thought would never say no did. The government are telling us the vaccine is vital to getting rid of COVID. So if you are unsure, please research into it carefully, listen to scientists and health professionals because that's where you'll get the right information. While going through the production of this video, what was so evident to me was that we owe the scientists, the key workers, the government and the NHS so much. It has been a difficult year for them and their struggles are not over. However, I couldn't end this video any other way but a tribute to all of those people who have kept the country up and running. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. 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 Thank you from me, from all of us, to the NHS. Virus detected. We are sorry for the inconvenience.